Tell me if this scenario sounds familiar to you. You go to the doctor and you say, hey doc, I've got this symptom. I want to know if I have inflammation. Can you please order some blood work or some tests to see if I have inflammation? So in this scenario, the doctor says, sure. And they order something like C-reactive protein or homocysteine, for example. They run the tests, they come back normal, and the doctor looks at you with a straight face and says, great news, you don't have inflammation. And you're left wondering, what the heck's going on? You sure feel inflamed, right? Like I've seen this happen with people who have lupus and severe irritable bowel syndrome and hypothyroidism with their TSH into the double digits. And yet the doctors tell them, great news, you don't have inflammation. And there is a rhyme and a reason to why this happens. And I do think that the medical provider usually has the best of intentions. It's just that their understanding of inflammation might not be quite at the level that we want it to be at. But in this video, I'm gonna teach you what you need to know about inflammation and what you need to know about what we're testing for before we get into the next two videos where I'm gonna talk about individual tests and panels that you can run to determine if you have inflammation. So stay tuned. Per my usual on this channel, I have to give you the explainer so that you understand what you're looking for before you go waste money potentially on tests that you're not gonna be able to utilize fully. So first couple things is that inflammation is a super broad term. Right? This is a big umbrella term of what we're looking for. And we all have that picture of what inflammation ought to be, right? Like if you sprain an ankle, you're gonna feel inflammation. There's gonna be redness and swelling and pain and tenderness. That's what we associate with inflammation. And yet there are other factors going on that you need to know about. But the first thing that I wanna point out is that A, inflammation is a very broad term. And instead of thinking of, of it as an umbrella term with other terms underneath it, I prefer to look at it as soup. So you go into the doctor, say your joints are aching and you wanna know if you have inflammation in the joints. So you go to the doctor and you say, hey doc, run me a test for inflammation, please and thank you. And what you're really telling them is, can you test me for soup? And they're going to try, but the reality is that each individual test and marker that they have the ability to run is looking for a type of soup. So you want to test to see if you have any soup whatsoever. That's what we all have in mind. But the tests like C-reactive protein, homocysteine, sedimentation rate, these are going to look for chicken noodle soup or tomato soup or lentil soup. Insert favorite soup of choice. You get what I'm, I'm going for here. So we need to, A, we need to be able to communicate what we're trying to go for. And we also need to acknowledge that when we run any of the tests I'm gonna teach you about in future videos, we are looking for a single type of soup. There is no single test, to the best of my knowledge, that can test for all of the soups. And this is actually some, somewhat analogous to autoimmunity and cancer. Right now, there is no single solitary blood marker that can tell you, yes, you have cancer or no, you do not. Instead, it's this process of doing a colonoscopy to rule out colon cancer, doing an endoscopy to rule out esophageal and gastric cancer, doing blood work to look for things like leukemia and lymphoma, doing biopsies. You have to go through these individual tests to test for the different types of cancer. It's very similar. Cancer is the soup and the different types of cancer are the flavors of soup. So in this instance here, we're looking for soup and we want that from our doctors, but they're running tests for individual types of soup. So A, just knowing that can be really helpful because it helps make sense of that frustrating scenario that I just painted. You have what is clearly inflammatory symptoms, you feel inflamed, you ask for a test, and then the doctor, well-intentioned though they may be, says, eh, you don't have soup because they don't realize that they only tested you for chicken noodle soup. So that is the first point that I wanted to make. The other thing that's worthy of knowing is that a lot of the different types of soup that we're looking for here and a lot of the different tests that measure inflammation are really looking at immune reactivity or a byproduct or a downstream consequence of immune activity or a compound that affects the immune system and its activity. So take the molecule C-reactive protein. C-reactive po protein, CRP, is a very commonly used inflammatory marker. It's great, I run it on every single patient. I think it's very useful to know that number. And I run it on myself yearly in a big batch of blood work that I just do on myself every single year and my husband. But a lot of people don't really understand what CRP is. 
So CRP is made in the liver in response to immune signaling molecules like interleukin-6, and the purpose of C-reactive protein, to the best of our knowledge now in 2022, is that CRP helps the phagocytic cells, the cells that come by, and you know, here's a molecule of stuff, say bacteria or virus or dead tissue that needs to be gobbled up. The phagocytes, the phag phagocytic cells are the cells that come in like Pac-Man and they gobble it up. C-reactive protein helps facilitate phagocytosis and it helps those cells work better. So it's the immune system turning on the production of C-reactive protein, and then C-reactive protein influences the behavior and the abilities of the immune system. It's all immune system stuff, but everybody talks about C-reactive protein for cardiovascular risk. It has very little to do with heart disease beyond that it correlates well with cardiovascular risk. It has everything to do with the immune system. So keep that in mind too, is that as we talk about this, keep that kind of in the back of your brain is that a lot of what we're going to talk about is the immune system and its function. And above all else, the, the real chief numero uno priority of the immune system is to protect you. And this is true if you have autoimmunity, this is true if you have cancer, this is true of anybody, any, well, anywhere right now. Your immune system has one goal and that is to protect you. Now, whether it's protecting you from real threats or perceived threats, that's a whole nother situation, right? Like we could get into the autoimmunity story of like the immune system protecting you from a perceived threat, but it's not really a threat. So what the heck are you doing guys? But the immune system is trying to protect you, whether that is an efficient, good process or not is up for grabs, but keep that in the back of your head as we talk about this inflammation story. The other thing to know, and this is why I drew this stick stickly guy over here is that immune function and therefore inflammation is very compartmentalized. So I'll paint you a story, for example. Um, I sprained my ankle pretty badly about four years ago. I was walking down a flight of stairs in the dark, uh, leaving my parents' house, and I just, I, my brain miscalculated how many steps there were. I thought that there was no more steps, and in fact, there was one additional step, and I fell off the stairs, and I sprained my ankle pretty substantially. Um, it was, it was okay enough that I was able to like take herbs and supplements and baby it and laser it and just really baby it for a month or two and it healed just fine on its own. And now, you know, it's, it's a happy ankle again years later. But, um, at the time and anybody who's had an injury can tell you this at the time I was experiencing compartmentalized inflammation. So my ankle was swollen and red and irritated and painful and yet my pinky nail on the left hand was not. My left eyeball was not. My right armpit was not. I don't know, I'm picking things at random here, but you get the idea. Just because one part of my body was experiencing inflammation does not mean that the rest of my body is experiencing inflammation. And there's a reason for that. Because again, inflammation equals immune activation in, in most contexts. There's a couple exceptions we'll talk about later on. But for the most part, it's your immune system rallying up and trying to fight something on your behalf to protect you. Well, if you think about what happened with the ankle injury, right? So like, let's, let's use our stick guy here. So we're going to, we're going to zoom in on the ankle here. And let's say we've got some muscle fibers, tendon, ligaments, We've got a blood vessel here. It's occurring to me right now that the difference between the purpley and the red color probably isn't coming across very well. Sorry. Um, I tried to make it as anatomically correct as I could. But if we zoom in, let's say when I sprain my ankle, right, like I tore some muscle fibers, maybe in a couple of different places. So there's a couple of muscle fibers that are now torn. There's tissue damage. And now we're left with bits and fragments like this right here or this right here. I'm left with bits and fragments of old dead tissue that can no longer perform its function. So one of the things the immune system does is it acts like garbage men and it swoops in and it cleans up old dead tissue and old debris. So the immune system is very active and needs to be very active when you have an injury, not just infection. So for example, let's draw, let's see. I'll draw it in purple. Let's say we've got some white blood cells floating around in this capillary that I've drawn, and they're kind of interspersed between the red blood cell. 
normally they would just cruise on by. On a day-to-day -day basis, they would not care about my ankle all that much. One here or there might come in, poke around, and then leave. But for the most part, they're all just going to leave the tissue. When I sprained my ankle and I had all of this tissue injury and there was a lot of signaling molecules telling the immune system, hey, we have an injury, you need to clean it up. The white blood cells are going to go into the tissue and they're going to start phagocytizing or gobbling up that material. Well, in order to do that, you need to make the walls of the capillary here a little bit leaky. So like there's a little, a little portal, if you will. And you can make these little pores, these little teeny weeny holes in the capillaries, and you can induce leaky capillary syndrome, if you will, if you want to be kind of analogous to leaky gut syndrome. But here's the thing, that is a very, very good thing. It's protective. If you didn't have leaky capillaries in the situation, the white blood cells would never be able to go in and clean up the debris, and then there would be more tissue damage and more inflammation and more problems, and then the tissue wouldn't be able to heal. So in this case, making the capillaries leaky so that more immune cells can come in to help gobble up that debris is a really good advantageous thing. But you don't necessarily want leaky capillaries in your entire body, right? I had sprained my ankle. I wanted leaky capillaries and cell signaling molecules like cytokines. I wanted those all compartmentalized in my ankle. I didn't want the capillaries in my left wrist to be leaky. I didn't want the capillaries in my right clavicle to be leaky or my right eyeball. You just want the immune system cells to be trafficked to the location where they're needed. You don't want an influx of immune cells all throughout the body all at the same time. You want to concentrate your, your army and send them to the place where they're needed. So one thing that I find that's lost in the conversation with a lot of these tests and a lot of the assessment of inflammation is that you can have inflammation in one tissue, but not others. And it's worthy of knowing blood is a compartment of the body in and of itself. Your blood is going to have a totally different pH and chemical balance and chemical signaling molecules and immune molecules and electrolyte balance compared to the fluid in between the cells, compared to the bone, compared to the liver, compared to urine, whatever it might be, whatever secretion or whatever liquid you have in your body, they're all compartmentalized. Otherwise, we would be like jellyfish. We wouldn't have any organs. Everything would just be a mishmash of goo. But we have these nice capillaries and arteries and veins that compartmentalize the cardiovascular system and keep it separate. And we have the renal system that keeps all of the like urine and, and filtrate from the blood separate. And we have the, uh, the blood brain barrier that keeps your nervous system separate. So that is something to know too, is that I think a lot of times what's happening with people when they get a test done for inflammation and it comes back negative and the doctor says, no, you don't have inflammation. I think a, the doctor doesn't always understand that they are testing for chicken noodle soup. They are not testing for all of the soup and that gets lost along the way. But the other thing is that nobody is stopping to appreciate that inflammation is compartmentalized. So you could have perfectly normal C-reactive protein or homocysteine or some inflammatory marker like sedimentation rate. You could have normal values in your bloodstream and yet you could have a really gnarly sprained ankle or you could have Hashimoto's or SIBO or something where the inflammation is much more localized. So that's really worthy of our attention because all of the stuff I'm gonna be teaching you in the next few videos are either blood tests or urine tests. But just keep in mind that when we're looking at immune activation and inflammation, it needs to be compartmentalized and it needs to be very tissue specific. So the great limitation in all of these tests that we're gonna talk about is that it doesn't test all of your bodily fluids and it doesn't test all of your tissues. So theoretically, the best way to test for inflammation, which would never be done, is to take a biopsy of every single tissue, every single organ in your entire body and take some blood work and some urine tests and then run it all and see what happens. But nobody's gonna do that. So we're left here in this, this midway point between wanting some objective data and I love objective data and I run these tests, do not get me wrong. And also knowing that none of the tests are perfect and that we have to just use our noodle and talk to people and hear their story, hear their symptoms. And I, you know, it's, it's the old, uh, if it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. If you feel inflamed, you probably have some degree of inflammation somewhere. It's just a matter of 
is it a type that we have a test for? And is it a type that uh, the test is readily available as like a blood test, for example, versus having you going out and getting like a liver biopsy. That's not super appealing and super readily available for anybody to just go do. Well, yet again, I'm not sure if I helped or hurt matters or bummed you out. <laughs> Let me know in the comments. I hope I didn't bum you out. The short answer to all of my videos is it's complicated. There's no such thing as a single test or a single protocol that has 100% efficacy, but that doesn't mean that they are without benefit. So in the next couple of videos, I'm gonna be talking all about those tests that I alluded to, things like C-reactive protein and homocysteine and many others that will help you build a clinical picture of whether or not you have inflammation. But like I said, at the end of the day, if it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. If you feel inflamed, you probably have some inflammation. It just might be compartmentalized and tissue specific as opposed to systemic and measurable in your bloodstream. Thank you so much for tuning in, guys. For those of you who don't know, FODMAP Freedom, my group coaching program, is opening up soon slash now. I, for, I have no concept of when I'm recording these videos anymore, but it's either soon or now. Uh, if you haven't joined the waitlist, the waitlist gang is going to get the email for early enrollment on August 22nd, 2022. So if you're on there, you're going to get an email. You're going to get first dibs on enrollment, which is pretty clutch because I think we're going to have to cut off the enrollment at some point during the enrollment period. So you want to get on that waitlist and you get a super special added bonus, which I'm going to email you about on the 22nd. So stay tuned. If you're watching this video the week of the 22nd and you're not really sure what all is happening, A, you can just email me and I'll send you the link. Also, if you join the waitlist the week of the 22nd, that gang of people is going to get a few emails. And the last one I have scheduled out to go out on Friday of that week. So if you're watching this video on like the 25th or something, you can still join. I'll send you the email on Friday or if need be, just email me and I can get you on the wait list. But the link is down below in the description. As always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.